Thank you, Killer Wives, episode 46. <laughs> Text him for murder. These are the case facts against Michelle Pyatt, who texted her lover to kill her husband. Isn't trust a bitch? <laughs> Las Vegas, Nevada, famous for beautiful showgirls. The MGM Grand, the largest single hotel in the free world, but also made famous for the murder of Staff Sergeant Nathan Pyatt. Lady Luck and Las Vegas are synonymous with slot machines, roulette wheels, and even a historical culture of murder. If you are prepared to pay the right price for the deed and to keep your mouth shut. On the night of Nathan Pyatt's death in Sin City, it would attract people by the millions to the bedazzling lights like malls to a flame. The Las Vegas trip would beckon travelers from all around the world for a piece of the $7 billion a year profit this town absorbs. Then there are others who don't care for the games, but are attracted to the adult version of Vegas and whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But if they ventured in a northeasterly direction of travel, beyond the glitz and glam of the Bellagio Water Show, they would have experienced some true live entertainment. On December the 1st of 2010, a car carrying Michael Rudolph Rodriguez and Mr. Corey Hawkins was headed in the direction towards Nellis Air Force Base Soldiers Outpost Housing. There they were hired to commit a murder by a wife. It was agreed that Corey Hawkins would sit in the car as a lookout while Rudolph Rodriguez would await Mr. Pear to go out of and exit the garage through an open door. The Deadly Duo at this point merely awaited a text from Mrs. Payette as to the precise moment that her husband was to exit the home so that they could kill him. Once the garage door swung open precisely, Rodriguez rushed in and shot Mr. Payette who had turned towards his car in the back five times before exiting that garage and fleeing in the vehicle now piloted by Mr. Hawkins. But Mr. Payette was strong-willed, strong-willed enough not to die on that cold garage floor. Even with five bullets to his back, he was able to stumble back into his own house before collapsing on the floor at the feet of his family, a family which included his four children and his wife, who be witness to his horrible death. There is a biblical quote that states, for man's enemies are those of his own home. I believe this one quote sums up the entire relationship between Mrs. Payette and her husband which ended in his dramatic death. Because you really have to hate someone you could sleep next to night after night, share meals with, children, and sex with before you could ever hope to imagine causing their death. Now directly after the shots rang out in that peaceful mountain bottoms community, authorities would receive several frantic 911 calls. One of those calls would come from a seemingly distraught Mrs. Payette at 11.31 p.m. on December the 1st. Now she would report that her husband had been shot at their home. That address was 9263 Altamonte Court in Las Vegas, Nevada, or as we refer to as Sin City. Immediately several police cruisers and detectives would be dispatched to that location. The first officer to arrive on the scene would be Metro Police Officer John Harris. Officer Harris would note the conditions of the house he was entering as well as the residents of that mountain bottom home. In his report, 
He would state that he saw blood stains on the garage floor and a streak of red on the white door leading to the inside of the house. As he walks inside of the home, he said he found Michelle Pyatt kneeling over her husband. Now, she was feigning administering him CPR. Those are his words, not mine. Now, why would a woman who would care for anyone fake like they were doing CPR instead of actually saving their life? Ms. Payette couldn't have used the excuse that she did not know how to administer CPR because the 911 operator on the other end of the line had run her through the entire procedure. And if you watch this channel in the past, even we ran you through that same procedure. Now, had Michelle been faking CPR the entire time, even with the 911 operator? Officer Harris noted in his report that nothing in the home was stolen, so this was not a robbery gone bad. Nathan's wallet was still on his person, and his keys to both vehicles remained on the blood-soaked garage floor. Officer Harris described another odd occurrence. As Nathan Pyatt lay there dying, he said Miss Pyatt reached her arms around him in what he described as a flirtatious hug that Officer Harris found strange, he said very strange. After paramedics arrived, one of Pyatt's children looked up at the officer and asked, is my daddy gonna be okay? Now how shameful must have been for his wife to allow her children to watch her husband bleed to death still in his military camouflage uniform, but she probably didn't anticipate that he would make it beyond the garage back into the home. Officer Harris would testify late at uh, Pyatt's trial that Michelle Pyatt did not appear upset and her demeanor did not match the situation. Upon his arrival, he asked Michelle concerning the incident, what could have happened, what she feel could have happened? Her answer was, it had to be random, she said. It had to be completely random. Now, this was an odd answer for a woman who was neither the detective, nor supposedly had knowledge of the person that had just killed her husband. Staff Sergeant Nathan Pat was taken to University Medical Center in downtown Las Vegas when he was later pronounced dead. How tragic it is to be married to a woman only to end up cooling on a morgue table two hours after you were scheduled to be at work that same night. The Pyatts had been high school sweethearts who went in Guam, moved to the U.S. and ultimately had four children with ages ranging from two years old to nine years old. But that happiness wasn't enough for Michelle Pyatt. She began having an affair with a man who she worked with at a telemarketing agency. And that affair would last upwards of six long months before her husband was murdered by that same man. Over the next week at Nellis Air Force Base, Mr. Pyatt's presence would be sorely missed more than he would at the residence he lived. Now Pyatt's job entailed assuring that the maintaining and the support of this country's F-15 base at Nellis would be top notch. These are the planes we need to defend this country. Now, Nathan was born in 1982 in Tominic, Guam. It was there that Michelle and he had become high school sweethearts. At the graduation, Nathan joined the Air Force in April 2002, and the two married in 2006. Nathan held the second highest senior enlisted position as a section technician assigned to the 757th Aircraft Maintenance Squadron. Wow. Additionally, Nathan was a combat veteran of America's second Iraq war. He was stationed at Ellis Air Force Base for three years, up until his untimely death at the hands of his wife. After his untimely death, there would be a base memorial for Staff Sergeant that would be attended by his fellow soldiers and the leadership of his squadron. The base honor guard would fold a flag and present it to his family, which they do at all these occasions. They're very solemn. Up until the moment that his wife would be arrested for planning Nathan's murder, the public nor his leadership knew that his wife had any connection. As in other Kilowatt's cases, the public typically feels bad for the surviving widow. A Nathan Pyatt Memorial Fund had been established to support Sergeant Pyatt's family at Wells Fargo Bank in Las Vegas. So she's about to get some money for killing her own husband on top of the other insurance money she's expecting. Many well wishers and contributors to this fund will feel duped shortly after learning that it was his wife that was responsible for his death. Just a, You're watching just a, Eminem, just the a, Men's just Channel. A, 
The morning after the murder investigation began to Camp's neighborhood to follow up on leads that came from the previous night's 911 calls. A Mr. Bauman told police officers that the neighborhood was dead until he said, I heard gunshots. He said he was outside walking his dog when he heard the serious gunshots that ended Nathan's life. He then said he saw a black Cadillac speed away from the scene. Now he noted that the lights on the vehicle came on, which is automatic in all cars these days, and then quickly went out or were turned off, and they left as quickly as possible, Bauman said. Now what the perpetrators did not want were the license plate and the tag lights to be visible. People are pretty smart when they kill people. They know if you get the tag number, they're finished. Detectives called Mrs. Payette to a second round of questioning after her husband's death. This was mainly because some new information came to light, which was the first piece of information would be that Mrs. Payette had increased Nathan's life insurance to $600,000 less than a month before he was killed. The second would be to see if she knew who owned the make and model of that vehicle that was seen fleeing her home shortly after the murder. Now, they weren't accusing her up front. They just want to know, did she know? Then they would ask Michelle, did she know of anybody with a car matching that description? Watch this. Michelle, not being experienced in keeping her mouth shut, would tell investigators that her fellow employee has a car matching that description. How dumb. Now, his last name was Rodriguez. Michelle would play down any romantic sexual relationship that she had with him as merely fellow co-workers. We knew each other. We were friends. We talked on the phone all the time. She never said that they actually slept together, which they did. When first questioned by the police about the state of her marriage, Michelle Pyatt admitted to flirting with other men at her workplace, which was telemarketing firm EIN Credit Incorporated in Vegas. It was then that she slipped and described one of those men as Rodriguez, who she had been texting messaging prior to her husband's murder. Wow. What police wanted her to admit was that she was texting not only her lover Rodriguez, but her husband's killer about his positioning and leaving the home so he could be murdered. On Michelle's phone when she surrendered, they located and asked her about the following text that she had disguised as benign conversations just in case they were ever caught. Now, these are the messages as follows. The first text message to Rock Regan said, Sorry, took my meds and was asleep. My husband just woke me up and he's trying to rush out the door. I guess he's late. Laugh out loud. Miss Pyatt was priming the killers to get ready for his exit so they could kill him. Now the second text message read, Can't go back to sleep right now. Got woken up by a man screaming, I'm late. He's rushing to get out the door. Laugh out loud. This message was sent about five or six minutes just before the shooting occurred. They were on time. State of Texas believes that the suspects knew Nathan Pyatt's schedule as given by his wife and were possibly waiting across the street by two vacant homes. The police proceeded immediately the following morning to compare the description of the fleeing vehicle with that of the car that driven by Mrs. Pyatt's lover, Rodriguez. Do these two cars match up? They would find his car which matched the description. They would then take a photo of that vehicle and ask witnesses if they remember seeing this particular car to which the answer would come back as yes. So, pretty much, they had their man, but there's no proof yet. Armed with this knowledge, police would bring in Mr. Rodriguez for questioning who would claim that he was having sex with Shannon Salowit, an ex-porn star, and during the time of Nathan's uh, Pyatt's murder. So he said, I, was, I didn't kill Nathan, I was having sex with an ex-porn star at that time. Now that he and that former entertainer checked into the Sunset Station Hotel in downtown Las Vegas, but when police officers went to question Shannon, she would give authorities a different version of those events. Shannon admitted that there was an ongoing plan to kill Nathan Pyatt that involved Rodriguez, Mr. Hawkins the driver, herself, Miss Jessica Austin, and Michelle Pyatt, the mastermind. She said she was expected to receive 5% of a few thousand dollars Rodriguez was to earn for the murder, or about $5,000. On the night of the murder, Shannon said she, Austin, Hawkins, and Rodriguez were at Austin and Hawkins' apartment in the 2500 block of North Green Valley Parkway in Henderson, which is a connected town. Now, Rodriguez and Hawkins then allegedly left to commit a robbery of a drug dealer using Rodriguez' black Cadillac. So he labeled it that so she wouldn't know. But by now, you know 
that Staff Sergeant Pyatt was no drug dealer, but actually an innocent active duty member of the armed forces of this country. So meanwhile, after the men left, Miss Austin lit a fire in the apartment's fireplace so that the men could burn their clothes when they returned from the murder. These days, people are into getting rid of evidence. Now, police said the unidentified woman went back to Austin and Hawkins' apartment the next day where she noticed the, sm the smell of bleach. Always when people kill people, they want to get rid of evidence. Now, Rodriguez and Hawkins then destroyed their cell phones along with the woman's cell phone and told her to lie to the police if they ask any questions. Now, this is accessory after the fact, aligned with before the fact. Now, the woman told police Rodriguez admitted to shooting Nathan Payette and Hawkins admitted to being at the scene. Police said records and video surveillance from Sunset Station Hotel, where they went, show Rodriguez and the woman checked in 40 minutes after the murder and not before, as he said. Rodriguez actually filmed this woman having sex with himself as a cover-up. Now, police executed a search warrant at Austin and Hawkins' apartment, at which point Austin told police she bought blue latex gloves and an air freshener at Walmart before the murder. She also told police Rodriguez burned his clothes in the fireplace. So a lot of people just cave in these murder cases. Now, Hawkins, Austin, and Rodriguez were held immediately at the Clark County Detention Center without bail, where it was discovered that Hawkins and Mr. Rodriguez had prior criminal records. Wow. Wonder of wonders. Wonder why. Now, although Mrs. Payette was the ringleader, she would be the last to be arrested among the other four co-conspirators. The Las Vegas Metro Police would arrest 29-year-old at the time, Michelle Chaco Payette, formerly of Santa Rita, charging her in a connection with the shooting death of her husband, Air Force Staff Sergeant Nathan Payette. Then Michelle was charged with murder with a deadly weapon, conspiracy to commit murder, and conspiracy to commit burglary. So she was going to steal her husband's insurance. Now police learned through Michelle's statements that she had been plotting to have her husband killed since the month of October. About two months difference. Now that's of the same year. The arrest report states that she sought help from her co-worker Rodriguez, who she was romantically involved with and told he told Michelle he could get someone else to help them for $200 thousand dollars. That's how they got the team together. The initial plan to get rid of Nathan Pyatt included her husband being shot in his car, which would be parked in an abandoned location in town and covered with a car cover to conceal the presence of his body. Wow, this is a good wife. Wife of the year material. The plan fell through and instead Michelle sent coded text message to Rodriguez as her husband prepared to go to work. Plan A doesn't work. Let's go to plan B. Police say the motive was insurance money as Michelle stood to receive $400,000 from the Air Force and another $250,000 from another life insurance policy in the event of her husband's untimely death. The main motive in a lot of these cases is money. For neighbors of the Pius, the murder and Pius arrest comes as a shock in the normally quiet neighborhood. A neighborhood Mr. Joseph Holder said, I'm just sad to hear something like that and somebody serving our country. It's horrible, he said. Another neighbor, Mrs. Juliet Marcy, has added, I would never suspect her to be involved. She never seemed like she did anything wrong. And if you watch the show long enough, you know in the beginning it says, isn't trust a bitch? And Nathan Pyatt's body was flown back to Guam for burial. It was a private family event with Anderson Air Force Base Honor Guard transferring custody of the Staff Sergeant's remains to the funeral home representative. We give you now a short clip of that solemn service. His body was flown back to Guam and arrived last Thursday on December 9th. During this time, family members wished not to make a comment on camera. The Pacific News Center respected their wishes, but off camera, a relative to Nathan, who wished not to be identified, says this was a senseless act. Nathan was given full military honors at the Veterans Cemetery in PD. Nathan's motorcade is escorted by three dozen motorcycles. Onlookers quietly watch on as six pallbearers slowly remove the flag-draped coffin from the hearse. They carefully carry Nathan to his final resting place. When they stop, family members and friends surround him. Then the final military honors are presented. The 21-gun salute, followed by taps. May Guam's son, Nathan, forever rest in peace. 
On the first day of testimony at Nathan Pyatt's murder trial, Michelle Pyatt broke down on the stand and she admitted to orchestrating a plot to murder her husband, who was shot five times by her boyfriend in the back and died in front of the couple's four children. Michelle then turned to her in-laws and tearfully said, I'm sorry. She said, I love you guys and I love my kids and I hope that this is closure for you guys. Ms. Pyatt avoided the death penalty by pleading guilty to conspiracy to commit murder and first degree murder with the use of a deadly weapon. Michelle Pyatt, 33 at that time, broke down on the stand as she admitted to having her boyfriend in a marriage. Shoot dead her husband, Staff Sergeant Nathan Pyatt, an Iraqi war veteran outside their Las Vegas home in 2010. So a lot of these soldiers' lives are safer in combat than they are in the presence of their own wife. Now the trigger man, Michael Rodriguez, 36 years old, was convicted of murder. He agreed to waive future appeals and accept a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole in order to avoid a possible death sentence as well. So neither of these chicks wanted to die. He didn't either. The Pyatt children are said to still be traumatized by the shooting as attested by their grandmother, whose care they are in today. At Michelle's sentencing, Nathan's mother had this to say to her former daughter-in-law. As a woman of faith, I forgive you because your soul clearly needs forgiveness. But went on to describe the ongoing impact of Nathan's death on the traumatized children. She said despite extensive therapy, they jump at loud noises and still feel their mom could harm them like she hurt their dad. She urged a judge for a sentence of life without parole because in their culture, they don't agree with the death penalty. Then the judge called the killing incomprehensible and unfathomable and was in disbelief that Michelle had continued now to sleep next to her husband at night knowing he was facing a needless death. The judge couldn't believe that she'd be powerless to stop the plot. She could have stopped it at any time. In 2016, Michelle Pyatt was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility ever of parole and so was Corey Hawkins after he pleaded guilty to charges against him to avoid the death penalty. So everybody wanted to avoid the death penalty, but they wanted to commit the death penalty. Michelle Rodriguez was also sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, while Jessica Austin pleaded guilty to conspiracy charges and was given parole. Now, in court, Michelle Pyatt sobbed that she told the judge that her husband was a good man, but his family says her love put him in a box in a cemetery. She says, I made a huge mistake and I really made bad choices and I'm truly sorry. That from a wife who orchestrated a murder. For Killer Wives, this is Charles Rivers. Thank you for watching.